Finally, let us take a look of the applications of the two special random variables we have just introduced. The first problem here we study here is the set balancing problem. So, so here, suppose that we have a class with M students, and then we can classify each student by checking whether they have any of the N skills as follows. For instance, skill 1 is whether a student can swim or not, skill 2 is whether a student can play piano or not, skill 3 is whether a student can cook or not. And now, one day, your boss, the headmaster of the school, asks you to divide the M students into two groups, G1 and G2. And the purpose of dividing into the two groups is that the headmaster wants the student to, to play into some competition. But he wants the competition to be as fair as possible, so that for each skill K, the number of students of, with skill K in the first group is roughly the same as the number of students with skill K in the second group. And most likely we see that there is no partition such that for each skill, the number of students in the first group is the same, is exactly the same as the number of students in the second group. Simply, when, when the number of students with a certain skill is having an odd number of students like that, then there is no way to do the partitioning. On the other hand, we can still do something that, that looks good, okay? We, want, we can try to minimize the maximum difference in the number of students of a certain skill after doing the partitioning. So for skill 1, the, the difference may be like 3, for skill 2, the difference may be like 5, and so on and so forth. So we want to minimize the maximum of these difference. So this is our target. Now for this problem, we may describe this as follows. Suppose that we have an input matrix A. This A is a zero one matrix, so each entry is either zero or one. And this A is an N by M matrix. So the matrix has N rows and M columns. Each row corresponds to a certain skill, and each column corresponds to a certain student. So an entry is one, if and only if the corresponding student has the corresponding skill. Okay, now our target is to find a partitioning of the students. So we are going to use an m by one column vector, let's call it b, to represent the partitioning. So this column vector will be a plus one or minus one vector. So plus one means that it is like partitioned into a certain group, let's say group 1, and minus 1 means that it is partitioned into another group, let's say group 2. And our target is to, to do the product of AB, so that after making the product of AB, and checking each entry of this AB, we want the maximum of this entry to be minimized. So, so the entry could be a plus value or could be a minus value. Plus means that there are more students in group 1 with skill K than in group 2. And on the other hand, if it is minus, so if the value of ABK, the kth entry of the product of AB is minus, then that means that for skill K, the number of students in group 2 is more than the number of students in group 1. And then we want to do what? We want to look at each entry in this ABK. For each entry, we take the absolute value. So this is the difference for the corresponding skill, so that the maximum of them is minimized. So we can describe the problem in an abstract way, like a matrix multiplication. So the input is a, is a matrix, and the target is to get a good column vector. OK, but here, the situation is that you want to be lazy. And it would be really, really nice if we can just get a random partition so that we don't need to think, just get a random partition of the students and then fool your boss that your partition is already good enough so that you can go home and do nothing. But what's your concern is, would a random partition look bad? Now notice that in the worst case, the maximum difference could be like of theta of m. So there are m students. So, so the maximum difference could be as high as 
something like of the order of m. So for instance, let's say half of the students know how to swim and half doesn't. Maybe after your partitioning, you put all the students who know how to swim in one group and all the students who doesn't know how to swim in the other group, then the difference will be really, really like half of the number of students. That's really bad. And luckily, this is the theorem that we can claim. So here, for a random m by one column vector b, so, so, so we are doing the random partitioning, where each entry is plus 1 or minus 1 with probability 0 0.5. So this is like you generate a random partition of the students, then this won't be bad. The probability, the max difference is greater than or equal to the square root of 4m log n. So this is roughly of the order of square root of m log n is really small. It is less than or equal to 2 over n. So in that case, even a random partition won't be bad. And if you encounter a bad random partition, then what you do is you just perform another random partitioning again. And then, and then it won't look bad again, probably. And if it's not, not like that, you do it again, okay? Yeah, because the chance for this to be bad, yeah, this is like, this is not bad at all, right? This is slightly larger than square root of m, right? Order of square root of m. So in most of the cases, it doesn't look bad. Now, how do we prove the theorem? Okay, so let us first examine a particular row of A. So a particular row for A is for skill, let's say row K is for skill K. Now suppose that there are J1s in the row in the matrix A. First of all, if the number of 1s is less than this magic number, square root of 4m log n, then no matter how you partition, no matter how you partition, the maximum difference correspond the difference generated or related to that row could never be more than this number, right? The worst case is you put all the J1s, the J the students with with that skill in one, one group and all the students with without the skill in the other group. But the difference is at most this J. So in that case, for case one, this is actually a good case for us. So if we encounter a certain row that has only a few number of ones inside, then no matter how you do the partitioning, you won't look bad. Now the problem comes from when a certain row has many ones. So j is greater than or equal to the magic number 4m log n square root. But then in that case, when there are a lot of ones, then we are also good because a lot of ones then then it is unlikely that all of the ones will be will be on one side. So, so here in this case, in this case, the contribution of the final value of a times b of the k entry of this one comes actually from this j. J, the j ones, each of them will will have a chance of getting into a plus one value or minus value with the same probability 0 0.5 in the final result of this ABK. So this is something that we have studied before, right? This is the sum of n, or not n, the sum of j independent plus 1 or minus 1 random variables. So, so we can apply the churn of bounds inside the theorem on the previous uh, page page 10 in this in this lecture and by setting r to be equal to this magic value 4m log n to the power of 0.5 the chance of a b k greater than or equal to this r will be less than or equal to we copy the bound there 2 times e to the power minus r square over 2j but here we don't know the value of j yeah so what should we do so let's worry a bit a, a bit later because we have r square here so r is the square root of this one, so r square is 4m log n. But we don't know the value of j, then what should we do? We, we have a rough estimation. So in that case, by changing j to be the maximum possible value m, we will find that this term is smaller than or equal to this term. And by doing some cancellation, you will get this one is okay. It is less than or equal to 2 divided by n squared. So, so here, this is the, 
probability that the cave entry in A B will be will be large. And the chance that it is large is only 2 over n squared. So the chance that all of the entries are not are not so this is the case that the entries is bad, right? So the chance that any one of the entry is bad will be less than or equal to 2 over n square plus 2 over n square plus 2 over n square and so on and so forth. It is because we can apply the union bound. So this is a chance that this is an upper bound of the chance that any one of the entry is bad. So if any one of the entry is bad, then the maximum difference will be bad. Okay, but then it is bounded by 2 over n. So this is the result that we want to obtain. So let's see this again. So we have now just bounded that the probability, the maximum difference is a little bit high, will already be very small. So in that case, for most of the cases, the maximum difference is going to be very small. Okay, so this is the set balancing problem. Okay, now let us revisit the fair coin flip problem. Suppose that we are going to flip a fair coin n times. So we let x to be the number of heads that we observe in these coin flips. So x will be a binomial random variable with parameter n and 0 0.5. Now previously, we have applied Markov inequality and Chebyshev's inequality to obtain the bound that probability of x is greater than or equal to 3n over 4. One of them is less than or equal to 2 over 3. The other one is less than or equal to 2 over n. But now, today, we have already got the churn of bound for this bin n 0 0.5. So we can now apply this one, this new bound. So the probability of x greater than or equal to 3n over 4 will be equal to, for this case, the probability of x greater than or equal to 1.5 mu. So it is like of the form 1 plus delta mu. Now by substituting delta to be 0 0.5 in the formula, e to the power minus, so we in this formula, so we have a form, earlier formula for this being this one, something like this. By substituting delta to be 0 0.5, okay, uh, we are not doing this, we are doing the right tail, right? But similar, okay, so we are doing this. We set delta to be 0 0.5, then we get, this is smaller than or equal to e to the power minus mu delta square. So if we plug in delta to be 0 0.5 okay so less so we will get something like this so the delta square and then the mu will will make it into n divided by 8 in the exponent so e to the power minus n divided by 8 now notice that this value is much much smaller than this value we are talking about the same bound so it is all of them are correct but then this is a very small value because n appears in the exponent rather than in the denominator. So this is really, really a small value. So here, why we get a very small value? Because we are making use of the moment generating function in obtaining the churn of bounds. And we are actually getting all the moments. So by getting all the moments into the into our and uh, consideration, we get the tightest bound than, than among the three. Now indeed, indeed, this is already very small. So let's see. This is the fact that we can actually obtain. The, the random variable x is actually concentrated around the mean. So what does that mean? We want to say that the probability that x minus mu is lightly large. So this is the value of the range square root of n log n, okay, is slightly large, will be already small, less than or equal to 2 over n. So, so in that case, so if this is like the probability distribution of x, so this will be like symmetric around the mean because it is uh, uh, in the sum of indicators, but then this is fair coin, so this is like symmetric. And then the if we get a region of like something like a small region of square root of n log n compared with the whole region of order of n, 
then we will see that for most of the probabilities, it will be inside this middle part. And the remaining part adds up to only up to 2 over n. And then how do we get this result? This is easy. This is just like what is the chance that x is greater than or equal to mu plus a and x is smaller than or equal to mu, plus, mu minus a. This is the a that we have. So we apply a certain channel of bounds that we have obtained before, then we get the result. So this is really very simple. So here, binomial random variable not just have good channel of bounds, but then, but then we can also claim that it has a concentration around the mean value. Okay, so that's the end for this lecture. Thank you.